Thanks for tuning in to the Christ Community Church message today. You're about to hear a message from the series Matthew's Book, where we explore the identity, actions, and teachings of Jesus. Now, we'd love to stay connected with you. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at CCC Omaha. Also, if you'd like to give financially, you can go online to my.cccomaha.org where you can make a donation. Thank you so much for your prayer and financial support, which helps us in blessing thousands of people all around the world. And now, the message. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you here today. Do go ahead and pull out your uh, phones this morning. Uh, My name's Mark. I'm the lead pastor here at Christ Community Church. And in all of our different venues, we're going to be having uh, an opportunity at the end of the service to do question and answer uh, via text message. So uh, we've got a phone number right here, and uh, this is the phone number. And uh, text any question you want about God, faith, the Bible, Christianity, world religion, science, culture, whatever you want to talk about this morning, and you get to set the agenda. So we'll have kind of a shortened message, and then we'll do question and answer at the end of that. You guys stoked for question and answer day? Yeah, like four people stoked for question and answer. That's good. Making me feel great this morning. Hey, uh, when Jesus came... Uh, way back when, we've been talking about how Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God. And in so doing, he was introducing the perfect, powerful reign of God into a battered and broken universe that we live in, that we are experiencing in this age what was to come in uh, the age to come. And the process of his life and death on the cross, he defeated three great enemies of God, three great, great enemies of God. And uh, we'll be taking a look at these three great enemies in our Kingdom Cure series. The first one is death, the second one is Satan, and the third one is sin. And each of these three great enemies of God have a secondary derivative that you can see Jesus exposing as well. The first one is disease. The second one is demons, and the third one is sins. For death, disease leads to death. Uh, Demons are a part of the minions that are associated with Satan. And of course, sins are the individual sins that people commit that contributes to the broader global problem of sin itself. And one of the things that we realize as we take a look at Jesus and his place in biblical history is that we live in a zone that's in between The kingdom of God being established when Jesus came the first time and the kingdom of God being completed when Jesus comes in the second time. It's this interesting no man's land where we have the kingdom of God that is already, but we also have the kingdom of God which is not yet. And we see Jesus interacting with each of these three different groups uh, as we read about him in the book of Matthew. So two weeks ago, we were here talking about the problem of disease, how Jesus heals diseases, and that when the kingdom of God comes crashing into this world, good defeats evil, and Jesus' healing defeats disease. Next week is going to be student takeover, and student takeover, they'll be talking about Jesus' defeat over sins and over sin in general from a story that's coming up in Matthew. And of course, that leaves me with the, uh, oh, ever so tasteful subject today, of talking about Satan and demons. Is that not what you woke up hoping for a sermon on today? You know, let's do the Satan demon sermon today. But we're going to go over it because it's what's uh, next up in the passage. And we'll be talking about this. So turn to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, beginning at verse 28. Matthew 8, 28. We're going to take a look at Jesus as he has an encounter with two demon-possessed men. And we're going to be talking about a subject that I don't think I've spent a message on in my eight years here at Christ Community. So we'll go ahead and tackle that today. All right, it says this. When he arrived at the other side in the region of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men coming from the tombs met him. They were so violent that no one could pass that way. All right, stop for a moment here. A little bit of a geography lesson. Jesus' ministry headquarters is a city called Capernaum that's on the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee is not a huge, you know, whopping sea. It's a lake that on a clear day you can see the other side of. And he's going down into this region, which is largely a Gentile, a non-Jewish Jewish region. But a short boat ride across the way is uh, the region of the Gadarenes. And Jesus goes there in order to be able to do his uh, ministry. So when they arrive there, who meets them? Who's the welcome wagon for the Gadarenes? It's two demon-possessed guys. And we find out these guys bust chains. They howl. They cut themselves. 
They're like their own little Halloween horror show. And we find this out from not only this passage in Matthew, but there are parallel passages in Mark and Luke where they tell the same kind of story. And uh, two demon-possessed guys. Now, before I go any further than this, just saying the word demon-possessed people is bound to elicit certain reactions from people in a group this size. For example, on one end of the spectrum is the person who says, you know what, I really believe in science and naturalism and the empirical world, and the idea of a spiritual world to me is something that I just don't buy. Or the idea of demons being in the spiritual world is something that I just don't buy. It's not a part of my experience. And then you've got the other side of the equation, which would be someone at the opposite extreme that would say, I'm so glad that today you're talking about demons because I've had some experiences of demons. In an extreme context, they may be people who live in fear of demons. They're scared of demons and the kind of influence that you may have in your life. Now, C.S. Lewis points out that the evil one and the demons, they're very happy if you're at either end of the spectrum because if you're at this end of the spectrum, you don't believe that they even exist. Well, they can sneak around unnoticed and have influence on things around you, and you'll never know about it because you won't believe that it's happening. And then on the other end of the spectrum is a dangerous place to live because if you are in fear of demons in the demonic world, well, then they can have a power over you that they really don't have to have. You're giving it over to them by being afraid of them. The healthy place to stand in this is right in the middle where you say, I know that the spiritual world is real. I know that demons really do exist, but I don't have to be afraid of them. I can have victory over them. I can be the one who is the conqueror uh, in this case through the power of Jesus. And throughout the rest of this message, what we're going to be doing is talking about some of the subtleties related to demon possession, demon oppression, and how you stand in that middle ground against them. So... These two guys in this story are not just being affected by demons. They are possessed by demons. There's a Greek word that would connotate that for us. It's daimonizomai. Daimonizomai. So that's long enough to be our big word of the week. Everyone say daimonizomai. Turn to the person next to you and say the new Japanese minivan is going to be called daimonizomai. So the idea here is these guys are not just being influenced by demons, but they are being filled by demons because demons want to inhabit something. They want to fill something. If a life is like a vase, a human life, an animal life, whatever, a demon says, I want to go in and fill that vase, that empty space that's in there. They want a body to inhabit. So they come up and they see Jesus approaching them. And no, these guys are so violent that nobody wants to cross that way. <laughs> But Jesus, he's got no fear at all. He says, I'm going to go right to where those two guys are howling. He parks his boat there, steps off the boat, and they greet him with this line. What do you want with us, son of God? They shouted. Now, before we go any further than this, instantly, they know who Jesus is. Demons are calling Jesus the son of God before the disciples are calling Jesus the son of God. And it just lends to that idea that there really is a very real spiritual world that's out there and the demons can recognize Jesus in his being the son of God in a way that people who have human flesh and see a regular ordinary guy may not be able to see. But the demons realize that instantly and they ask him a question. Have you come to torture us before the appointed time? Now on that line, I want to point out another small but very important thing. The demons know that their ultimate destiny is destruction and torture. We find out that that's going to be in the lake of fire. That's where they're going to be thrown eventually. Their fear is that Jesus has come to do that prematurely. They know that there is a finish line at the end of their timeline that they're going to be thrown into that lake of fire. But they think, hey, we've still got some time to play on this playground called Earth here. And Jesus, are you coming to torture us? before the time is right for us to have our final torture. That's what they're scared of. They know about this kingdom of God that's coming in its fullness. They know that the return of Christ is going to make that complete. So they have an awareness of some things that even the people around them did not have at the time. Okay, next point. Our next part of the passage, it says this. Some distance from them, a large herd of pigs was feeding. The demons begged Jesus, if you drive us out, Send us into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, go. 
And so they came out and went into the pigs, and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and died in the water. Now that's a weird story, isn't it? I mean, demons go into a herd of pigs and they create a massive suicide mission. I got a question for you. What do you get when you throw a legion of demons into a herd of pigs? Deviled ham. Okay, I knew that that was really bad before I said it. I did, and I just, I went there anyway. I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that one. Now, it's interesting that the demons have a respect for Jesus, right? And they have a request, and Jesus grants the request. Why he does that, I'm really not totally sure after I've studied it this week. But one thing that you can see for sure is that these demons are bent on destruction. Whether it's the destruction of the people that they inhabit who are cutting themselves and using their feats of supernatural strength to do wild things and be violent towards others, or whether it's the pigs heading towards destruction in the water, there is a destructive bent towards the demons. And besides that, some poor pig farmer just lost a lifetime of dinner hams and his whole income stream in the process. The point is that the demons want to get into a vase. They want to inhabit something, and the pigs happen to be close by. I want you to imagine that each of you, your life is a vase as well. And it's a vase that gets filled by something. And you have to ask yourself the question, what am I going to have it filled with? Interestingly, in this passage, in the versions in Mark and Luke, we find out the name of the demon in front, inside of one of the demon-possessed men. Because Jesus says, what's your name? He says, I am Legion, for we are many. Now, a legion was a Roman guard unit made up of somewhere between 1,000 and 6,000 soldiers. And so, in essence, what he's saying is there are a lot of demons that are inhabiting inside this container. There's a lot, of, there are a lot that are in here. And demons go about searching for places to live, for places to visit. And it's interesting that even though there is a whole legion of demons, the legion of doom living inside this guy, that this is not a problem for Jesus at all. They're instantly afraid. And did you notice how easy and casual it was for Jesus to throw out the demons? One word, he says, go. And they rush out into the herd of pigs. Jesus just has that kind of power. He sends demons wherever he wants to. And demons look for that home to live in. There was another place uh, in the Bible that talks about if you're, a demon is cast out of you, be sure that you fill up your vessel with something else so that there's not room that's left in there for seven demons to come in and say, hey, spring cleaning in this house, we're going to take up residence in this person's house. All right, continuing on with the story. It says this. Those tending the pigs ran off, went into the town, and reported all this, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Then the whole town went out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they pleaded with him to leave their region. Now, the pig keepers, who suddenly don't have a herd of pigs, have just incurred a staggering loss of income. They run back to town to tell everybody what's been happening, that the Halloween horror show is over and their pigs are gone. And everyone comes out and they see that's exactly true. They see two perfectly normal, not demon-possessed men sitting there having intelligent conversation and a bunch of pig carcasses bobbing in the lake. So, because they're suspicious of a guy with the level of power that Jesus has, and because they're in despair because of the low bacon supply for the future, and they don't want any demons thrown into their pigs, they ask Jesus to leave the town. People were freaked out by power. And they wanted to guard their income, but they missed the biggest deal in the passage. And that's that two guys who were demon-possessed are now in their right mind. That Jesus, in fact, has the power to free people from the spiritual forces of darkness that would keep them enslaved. Jesus can free them. Now, as you take a look in our culture, people oftentimes might ask the question, okay, I've heard of these demon stories in the Bible or in the ancient world. I've heard about them in maybe third world countries. 
Is there a difference or what is the difference between demon possession and mental illness? Do demon-possessed people even exist in the United States today? And the answer is yes, they do. I mean, you don't see them in malls and schools very often. They're most likely in urban areas or on the streets or in mental institutions. In fact, I think that sometimes it's the case that mental illness is misdiagnosed as possession, and sometimes demon possession is misdiagnosed as mental illness, and we need to be really clear to get the two things straight. In the Bible, even in a single verse, like Matthew chapter 4, verse 24, it talks about people being afflicted with various kinds of illnesses and demon possession. It puts them in two separate categories that are there. So some people may ask, what are the characteristics of a possession as opposed to mental illness? Well, mental illness is oftentimes the result of a trauma, chemical imbalances, bad experiences, birth defects, or missed expectations. And while this is a challenge, it's very different from demon possession. Demon possession happens as a result of someone filling up their, ba filling up their vase with the evil one or with his minions. This oftentimes happens as the result of satanic rituals sometimes even foisted upon kids at a very young age, or maybe at the hands of severe abuse, or perhaps giving oneself over to certain forms of sexual depravity, or involvement in channeling, or tarot cards, or Ouija boards. And friends, some of these activities may seem to be innocent at first, but they are doors through which people can overtly invite spiritual forces of evil to come into their vases, to invade their lives. And that's why I'm saying don't even go there. Don't even dabble in it. Don't even mess with that kind of stuff because it's truly dangerous. If you read the passages about these demon-possessed guys in Mark and Matthew and Luke together, you can put together a list of interesting characteristics that help to give clues as to what demon possession looks like as opposed to mental illness. Symptoms of demon possession, in this case, the guys were living in a tomb. In general, they live outside of community. They're so violent, so difficult, that they can't live inside of normal community. They have supernatural strength. In this case, these guys would break chains with their raw strength that they could get iron or leg irons off of their legs. They're bent on violence, towards people around them, and violence towards themselves, self-destruction. One of the passages talks about how these guys cut themselves with rocks. And then the final piece is voice control. The, the voice that comes out of the person is not actually their voice or their words, but the demons speaking through them, oftentimes howling and shouting. This is very common in supernatural demonic encounters. Demons speaking in the first person just like this guy. What do you want with us, son of God? This guy said in this passage. And when encountering people who are possessed, it's like they take on an entirely different persona with a different voice during that period of time that they are possessed. Now, no one of these necessarily would be conclusive evidence that somebody's demon-possessed. Any of them could be a red flag. And if you're seeing a lot of them or all of them in the same place, I think that it should be a clear warning Simon, sign that demon possession may be taking place in that person's life. Now, in a general sense, most of the demonic activity that we see is not possession. As a matter of fact, the role of demons is very contained in this world. Their general place is to lie and deceive and point people in the wrong direction. They mostly do their work not from inside the vase, but from outside the vase, speaking things that are untrue to people in order to get them on the wrong track. Because their ultimate goal is not destruction. Their ultimate goal is just to keep people from God. And if they can do that through materialism or distraction or escapism, if they can do it through apathy or drugs or being given towards a particular sin or video games or whatever it is, anything that would keep you from God, that's their job. And that's what they're trying to do by influencing you externally. So here's what oppression looks like as opposed to possession. Oppression has an external voice that's outside of the vessel that's speaking to it. It's not an internal voice that comes from the inside. It's oftentimes typified by third-person condemnation. What do I mean by this? It's about things that you hear said about yourself, or maybe you even repeat and say them about yourself, but they're said in the third person. Like, you are ugly. You deserve this pain. You are not good enough. 
God could not love you. You are shameful. Those kinds of words, if you find yourself hearing those, saying those, repeating those kinds of words in the third person, you don't talk about yourself in the third person. When you're talking about yourself, it's I, I. And God never says anything shameful or condemning towards you from the outside. So if it's not you and it's not God, it's obvious where the source of that pain is coming from. Now, again, this takes the form of lies and influence, but not of any kind of control. There's nothing in that that you can't resist or put off. Now, I say this to draw an important distinction because Christians, therefore, can be oppressed. You can have voices that are trying to communicate from the outside, but you cannot be possessed. Why do I say that? Because when you invite Jesus to come inside your life and take control, he fills up your vessel. You invite the Holy Spirit to come in and he fills up your tank. And when you're filled up with Jesus, is he going to slide aside and make room for demons? Okay, let me ask you that out loud. Is Jesus going to slide aside and make room for demons? No, Jesus is not going to do that if he lives inside of you. He doesn't want to share that house with anybody. You give yourself to Jesus and you cannot be possessed by those who are the opponents of Jesus. You need to be filled, but not filled with demons. You need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which of course brings us to our second big word of the week today, which is Holy Spirit is oh my. <laughs> so everyone say that. Ready? Holy Spirit is oh my. Yeah, that's to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I totally made up that word. Okay, that has nothing to do with any kind of reality. But I wanted to point this out because when you are filled with the Holy Spirit of God, you hear these other voices that come into you. Voices that say things like, you are loved. You are a child of God. You are precious to me. You matter in my kingdom. I have plans for you. I made you special. I made you for something. And this is good news. Amen. There's a God who loves you and wants to speak truth into your life. And the more you give yourself over to the love and the power of Jesus, the less these other voices can influence you. If you want to thwart the effects of the enemy, just fill yourself up with the Holy Spirit. It's an easy answer. Fill yourself up with the Holy Spirit, and then there's not room for others. In fact, James chapter 4, verse 7 gives us a clear formula for how to fill ourselves up and how to avoid the uh, effects of the devil. He says this, two things, submit yourselves then to God. That's step one, submit yourself to God, give yourself fully to him. And then step number two is to resist the devil and he will flee from you. Uh, that's good news. He doesn't have to have any power or control or influence over you. As a matter of fact, it kind of cracks me up sometimes when I see some Christians at prayer meetings doing their like, major yelling, spiritual battle, talking to Satan kinds of prayers. And I just go, you know, I'm not mad at you for doing that, but you know you don't need to do that because <laughs> he's really not that powerful in your life. He doesn't have to be. When he's trying to speak lies to you or influence you, you treat him like an annoying mosquito. That's what you just, Would you get away from me? Because you have no power here. That's all the more influence that you need to put in there. Jesus has power over my life, not you. And then instead of obsessing over something that would be evil or demonic, simply turn your attention towards Jesus. Because when you obsess on things that are evil and demonic, all of a sudden your mind is turned towards all the wrong things. When you turn your mind towards Jesus, then your mind fills up with the goodness of God and there's just no room for any other influence. That's what you need to do in your life and you'll be able to experience the power of God working in you. You have to focus on what you are filled with, not on what you are resisting. So that's our big question for the morning. It's this. What are you going to be filled with? What are you going to be filled with? What are you going to be possessed by? You're going to be possessed by the God of the universe, the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the way to go. Now, for some of you, I know that this is a new thing. Like to even think about having God inhabiting your life is a brand new thing. And you can do it simply by inviting Jesus to come in and being the one who takes over, takes control of your life. Believing that what he did on the cross was for you, that he's got power over life and death, and he's the power to live inside you. So you can make that decision in a moment simply by inviting Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit to live inside of you. Some of you guys are veterans. You've been Christians for a long time, and it's a good practice to be in to be inviting the filling of the Holy Spirit in your life. 
I mean, he, he doesn't leave you, he doesn't run away, but to invite his filling every day to live through you is a healthy practice. As a matter of fact, for me, when I wake up in the mornings, one of the first prayers that I pray, oftentimes before I even get out of bed, is that old chorus that comes from the 1980s. For those of you who have been around a long time, I used to sing it in my college group. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And to experience those fresh winds of the Holy Spirit filling up my life, there's no room for anything else. Or sometimes when I'm filling up my gas tank, I have certain little devices that I'll use in my life, in my mind, to pray certain prayers. So sometimes when I'm filling up my gas tank, I'll say, God, fill me up, fill my tank. Like this gas tank is being filled up. The power of the Holy Spirit fills me up. It's an everyday practice for people who are believers. And I want to invite you to make that a practice that is a part of your life as well. As a matter of fact, I thought as we finish the message, it would be great just to finish it by closing with that kind of a prayer. And I want to invite you all, in all of our different venues, I want to invite you to be praying that prayer with me. And I'm going to invite you to do something a little, just a little bit different, a little special. Sometimes a posture can help us with our vulnerability before God. And so I'm going to invite you to hold your hands out as if you really want to receive the Holy Spirit to come into your life and fill you up like God's given you something. So you can put your hands out like this. And I'm going to pray that little prayer that I just said one line at a time. And I'll say it out loud. And then if you agree with that, if you want that, then you pray it after me as well. You ready? Let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. And God, as these friends pray this genuine prayer, I just pray that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would fill their tanks and would help them to experience all of the life that Jesus has including full resistance to the devil and all the schemes that he may have against us. Help us to live lives that uh, are remarkable in the sense that the supernatural power of the living God lives inside of us. It's not just us getting better and better a little bit at a time, but it's your transforming power that works inside us. And we give ourselves afresh to you on this day. And all God's people agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Amen.